but the fact that they are targeting uh, children specifically and plan to target them in a massive way uh, within 10 years is just stunning. Um, and I think shows that these people really think um, they cannot be stopped. And it's really, you know, uh, I would argue up to um, concerned parents and concerned citizens um, to protect the most vulnerable from this type of invasive technology. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome back, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, in a conversation that's being recorded on the 6th of July, 2021. And I'd like to think that Corbett Report listeners are particularly well-situated to understand the otherwise seemingly bizarre left term that the generated COVID crisis has taken in recent months with this bio-digital convergence and transhumanism talk and all of these crazy ideas that are coming about as a result of this. I, As I say, I'd like to think that if you've been listening to my report for years or a decade or a decade and a half, you will have seen this coming um, because, of course, biodigital convergence is just the old wine of transhumanism in a new bottle, and transhumanism was just the old wine of eugenics in a new bottle, um, coined, of course, by the brother of uh, Brave New World author Aldous Huxley, a.k.a. Julian Huxley, who, uh, in addition to being a card-carrying eugenicist, was also the founder of UNESCO, talking about how we need to make eugenics a politically acceptable idea again. As I say, you will know all of that history if you have gone into my reports on this in the past, but even so, even if you were on some level prepared for this left turn, it is getting extremely crazy extremely quickly, perhaps more so than people can even keep a handle on. And Mia Copa, me too. I, I, I have to say, this article that we're going to be talking about today uh, touches on this whole other institution slash set of programs that I didn't even have on my radar until I read this article. So I think this it serves your interest to read it. Today we're going to be talking about the latest article from Whitney Webb at unlimitedhangout.com, which I hope you are checking on a regular basis. If not, you will want to read this article in particular. It's called A Leap Toward Humanity's Destruction. And Whitney, your articles are known for being voluminous and detailed, and boy, this article does not disappoint on that front. So <laughs> thank you for writing this, and thank you for introducing us to Welcome Leap. Now, as, as I say, this is such a big article. There's so much data in here that we should and could dig our teeth into. But so I, I think there are three different ways that we can start to approach this topic. We could start with the cast of characters and outline who these people are and their shady backgrounds and where they're coming from. We can talk about the Welcome Leap itself and what it is and its relation to the Welcome Trust, which we, we were talking a little bit about in our previous conversation about AstraZeneca. Or we could talk about the programs that are being forwarded under Welcome Leap. And I think either any one of those would serve as an entree into this conversation. What would you like to start with? Um, well, what I started with in the article was the cast of characters, because I think it uh, it shows when you look into their background specifically that um, their professed desire through Welcome Leap, this new organization they've made to uh, improve global public health and all of these things um, are not exactly what they claim uh, to be. Um, but, you know, um, we can definitely talk about the first two of those uh, together in sort of a, a reduced way, because as you did uh, point out, this article uh, is quite long, but it, it, it is that way because I was hoping to extensively document it that other people can make summaries and whatnot just to have as much, you know, detail and documentation there for people that want that. Um, of course, it's not, <laughs> not for everyone. Um, but essentially, uh, for people that don't know the Wellcome Trust, it's uh, the world's wealthiest uh, private medical research charity that was created uh, uh, through the will of Henry Wellcome, who was a pharmaceutical magnate um, whose company Burroughs Wellcome um, eventually went through several mergers to now become what is now GlaxoSmithKline. Um, so GlaxoSmithKline, more often than not, uh, will have ties to uh, the Wellcome Trust and 
<clears throat> in terms of research and other initiatives. And you can see some of those uh, connections in, in this article. Um, but the Wellcome Trust has had, uh, even going back to the 1990s, there was a Sunday Times investigation into the Wellcome Trust, just about the extreme uh, power and influence this had, particularly in, in the fields of genetics and bioengineering, with the Sunday Times saying back then that the decisions the Wellcome Trust make will shape the future of the human race uh, for years and decades to come. And that was back in 1994. Um, and of course, this institution has been around since uh, Henry Welcome died in 1936. Um, and um, as we talked about last time, yes, uh, they did have some connections, several connections uh, to the AstraZeneca um, Oxford vaccine, but also the organization known today as the Galton Institute, which was previously the Eugenic Society and maintained that name until 1989, uh, when it changed to the Galton Institute, claiming that it no longer favored eugenics, but oddly renamed themselves after the founder of eugenics, uh, Francis Galton, who instead of uh, labeling a racist eugenicist they describe as a brilliant 19th century polymath so that can sort of tell you about their um their their opinions of that um particular field but basically the wel what welcome leap is is a team up of the welcome trust with uh uh, two individuals that used to run uh, DARPA under the Obama administration, uh, and both of whom later went on to create DARPA equivalents for Silicon Valley at Google and Facebook, basically creating privatized DARPA uh, for Silicon Valley, specifically Silicon Valley companies whose early origins have ties to the U.S. national security state, uh, Google having received considerable funding and input from the CIA in its founding, and uh, Facebook having considerable ties to uh, DARPA itself, among other things, which I've detailed in a previous um, article. So um, those ties are quite concerning. And then, of course, the Wellcome Trust um, in addition to its uh, dominance, really, of medical research globally, uh, also works very closely with the World Economic Forum and was actually uh, the mastermind behind wel uh, the Wellcome Trust uh, and World Economic Forum's team up with the Nuclear Threat Initiative, uh, which, if you're not familiar with that, um, it was co-created uh, by Ted Turner, another uh, depopulation promoting billionaire who uh, owns CNN. And the... Um, <clears throat> The other founder is a uh, former Senator Sam Nunn, who um, if you are familiar with the dark winter exercise from June 2001 that eerily predicted the 2001 anthrax attacks, you will know that Sam Nunn uh, basically led that exercise <laughs> pretending, you know, playing the role of president uh, in that simulation. Um, and of course, um, in, in NTI's role in this partnership with WEF uh, and, the, and the Welcome Trust is actually funded by a former Facebook executive, one of the co-founders of Facebook, Duskin uh, Muscovitz. So uh, it's quite interesting to see uh, these players uh, come up more often than not um, in what Welcome Leap uh, is and does. And so Welcome Leap officially defines themselves as a global health DARPA, a DARPA for health. It's no coincidence that this launched around the same time that uh, the Biden administration, or that this came, uh, has become more um, prominent, has been, has been launching more programs. It was created last year. But the Biden administration in the past couple months has promoted the creation of a health DARPA for the US specifically, HARPA, which is actually an agenda uh, that goes back to the Trump administration uh, and was being designed and created by a former uh, DARPA, the former head of DARPA's biological technologies office. So Welcome Leap is basically a global uh, research agency focusing on, on bioengineering and transhumanist tech that is also being modeled by national governments. Um, so this isn't necessarily um, exclusive um, in, in, in that sense, it, um, but it's definitely something to look at. And um, as we can get into in a moment, their projects are um, really astounding in what they uh, claim to achieve within a five to 10 year period, which is quite small, but with the, the, found, uh, the, the influence and the funding of the Welcome Trust and of course the, the um, US military and Silicon Valley connections here um, definitely make this a, a formidable force but of course, it's uh, only really been set up and is just beginning, and their agenda can be stopped if we uh, make it so. Excellent. Well, that's a, that's a very good summary of a lot of information. Um, so again, I hope people will go to the article itself for all of the links and all of the information there. But let's not gloss over 
the couple of characters that you mentioned there who, as you say, were DARPA uh, officials under Obama who went to Google, went to Facebook. Uh, specifically, we're talking about Regina Dugan and the uh, Gabriel, I forget his name. Ken, Ken Gabriel. Ken Gabriel, mm-hmm. that's right. So let's let's talk a little bit about them and their background. Sure. So uh, Regina Dugan started her career at DARPA, I believe, in 1996. Uh, She leaves in 2001 to become uh, one of the top advisors to the U.S. Army Chief of Staff uh, from 2001 to 2003, which, of course, most people are aware coincides with the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. She was advising on counterterrorism issues in, in that scenario. Um, A few years later, she creates a a defense contracting firm called Red X Defense that gets her into a lot of trouble uh, when she is named director of DARPA uh, under the Obama administration in 2009 uh, because she starts basically giving uh, numerous lucrative contracts to her company uh, when they didn't necessarily deserve them and then is uh, found later um, uh, violating uh, government ethics um, stipulations. Of course, nothing is done, as, as is often the case. But her company, Red X Defense, for example, focused on um, IED uh, detection technology, roadside bombs uh, for use in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was found that their technology was just as useful as flipping a coin, uh, basically meaning it didn't work. Um, So this is the type of woman uh, she is in these types of institutions. Her time at DARPA is pretty significant because she founded um, a couple key offices that sort of uh, set what would uh, uh, defined her career in subsequent years, such as creating the Transformational Convergence Technology Office. Of course, as you mentioned, this biodigital convergence, transformational convergence is is quite similar in, in as as far as buzzwords go. And this was about uh, this particular office was about combining synthetic biology. Uh, machine learning and social networks specifically, um, and some of that has since been folded into what is now the Biological Technologies Office or BTO of DARPA that focuses on a lot of um, biotech and transhumanist tech and neurotechnology that is health focused, uh, they say more often than not. But I would argue, at least in the context of today's events, um, Dugan's most important contribution at DARPA was her decision to green light DARPA's investments in in the uh, mRNA vaccine uh, production platforms of both Pfizer and Moderna, which uh, ended up taking place in 2013. She left in uh, 2012, but had green lighted those investments before they were made. And uh, the program manager at DARPA that worked with Dugan on this, Dan Wattendorf, uh, now is, I think, head for innovation of special solutions or something like that um, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So again, <laughs> just amazing how um, you know cohesive uh, the players. Small are, world, uh, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, she's basically headhunted from DARPA in 2012 um, by Google uh, and uh, ends up heading Google's Advanced Technology Products Group, uh, abbreviated as ATAP or ATAP, uh, which was basically Google um, acquired um, Motorola Mobility from Motorola and wanted to basically uh, use that company's um, assets to create their own DARPA, essentially. And that's what uh, ATAP, Google's ATAP is, and Dugan was put in charge. Uh, but it was actually Dugan's deputy, Ken Gabriel, who is now chief operating uh, officer of Welcome Leap, that created uh, that group for Google, and then Dugan uh, was put in charge, which is qu- <laughs> quite interesting because, especially now with Welcome Leap, you can see that that Dugan and, and Gabriel's careers tend to uh, uh, intersect at various uh, times throughout history. Um, so why she's at Google, uh, Dugan is involved in, in developing a lot of um, controversial things, including uh, a digital pill that uh, when you swallow it, turns your whole body into an authentication token. Um, and some uh, media report said it turns you into a cyborg, sort of, um, and all of this stuff while also fawning over, over Dugan. Um, but basically, um, you know, she also was responsible for um, developing a digital tattoo uh, used to unlock smartphones. Uh, not unlike, of course, uh, some people, of course, are probably familiar with the Bob Langer uh, developed, uh, or maybe it was MIT developed, but not Bob Langer. Uh, but the digital tattoo for vaccine records and stuff like that that was promoted um, 
uh, last year. So, you know, um, this whole thing, of course, of vaccine passports and vaccine records being tied uh, to digital biometric IDs and all of that is, is an agenda that's come to the forefront. Um, in recent months. So it's interesting to see Dugan's role in that. And then um, she also created the basis for uh, what is now Google's augmented reality or AR business and uh, smart clothing called Project uh, Jackard, uh, which is basically weaving multi-touch sensors and conductive wiring into textiles. They have partnered with Levi Jeans. <laughs> uh, so that's fun. And she basically describes her work at Google as solving what she describes as the mechanical mismatch uh, between humans and, and machines. It really doesn't get more transhumanist than that. And while she's serving uh, in this capacity at Google, she uh, is leading panels at the Clinton Global Initiative and attending Bilderberg meetings with Eric Schmidt, who was her boss then and has been a major player in determining uh, U.S. national uh, artificial intelligence policy for both the military and the intelligence community, um, oddly enough. So uh, Dugan eventually gets headhunted again from uh, Google, goes to work for Facebook, where uh, she basically uh, leads and, and helps build Facebook's own DARPA equivalent, uh, then called Building 8. They have since renamed it something else. Um, the project uh, she started there was the creation of a what they describe as a neural wearable, um, essentially a wrist brand, a wristband that from your wrist can read your brain signals, know what you're going to type before you even move your fingers, um, among other things. Um, and actually, Facebook has uh, showcased prototypes of this, uh, two different prototypes, a few months ago, and claim that they will have it uh, available in a couple years. They claim that it won't be able to read your brain, even though they basically say that what it does is read your your brain signals, just only some of them. Um, trust Facebook as much as you want with that type of access um, to your body. I know I certainly Oh, it won't be. But anyway, Dugan eventually leaves Facebook mysteriously just 18 months after joining and, and building uh, building eight to focus on building and leading a new endeavor, which we later find out is actually Welcome Leap. Um, and so that's essentially um, what Dugan's been up to in a, in a nutshell since uh, becoming the chief executive officer of Welcome Leap. She has also joined the Council on Foreign Relations Task Force on U.S. technology and innovation policy alongside uh, Eric Schmidt, uh, LinkedIn's Reid Hoffman, and some other um, prominent individuals, including uh, Biden's top science advisor, head of the uh, Broad Institute, uh, Eric Lander, who, of course, was funded by Jeffrey Epstein, among other uh, unsettling connections there. Whew, that was... Uh... Quite a whirlwind tour, and again, yeah, sorry. I, well, it's all there, and it, there's links to back up each and every part of this. And I, I have actually had Regina Dugan on my radar for several years now because of that DARPA Facebook, and well, we're going to read your mind and all of this. I mean, it's just a right. crazy story. I didn't know all of the details of that though, and it's just it gets crazier the more you know. And here she ends up at Welcome Leap, um, developing. Again, uh, it's almost as if, you know, the World Economic Forum stakeholder capitalism uh, public-private partnership ideal is at play here. We have the best of all worlds, oh, the yeah. philanthropic world, the, the corporate for-profit world, and the public world is ne nexusing in here with these... What I mean, what is someone like a Dugan or a Gabriel? They they are government employees. They are for profit. They're at these philanthropic institutions. They're inter interfacing with all these other people at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and everywhere else. It is just a group, a group of people who are in public or private business as the need arises for their cover for the next stage of an agenda that is clearly unfolding here. What's your take on? Well, what Welcome Leap represents in terms of that nexus of philanthropic slash profit slash public enterprises? Um, I think what Welcome Leap is, is a way to supercharge and rapidly advance um, this type of technology that uh, the ruling class that is behind this agenda feels like it needs to develop sooner rather than later in order to succeed in accomplishing what they want to accomplish before 2030, which is a year that comes up again and again, including in Welcome Leap, uh, but also in various other uh, related agendas and policy documents focusing on that year specifically. And of course, Welcome Leap, created in 2012, aims to complete all of its projects uh, by 2030. Uh, they make that quite 
quite explicit. So I think um, by combining, uh, by having it led by someone like uh, Regina Dugan and Ken Gabriel, who really more than anyone else um, embody the revolving uh, door between the military industrial complex and Silicon Valley, which has become much more um, overt over time. You have those connections, you have uh, the Wellcome Trust and someone uh, specifically Jeremy Farrar at the Wellcome Trust who has been intimately involved with a lot of uh, the crafting of of the uh, narrative uh, for COVID-19, particularly the zoonotic origin narrative with uh, uh, people like Peter Daszak and and Anthony Fauci actually appearing uh, as one of the most heavily redacted individuals in the recently released Fauci emails, uh, ostensibly the head of this charitable trust um, being intimately um, involved in that is quite significant. And then also there is another individual that is quite important to point out who is Jay Flatley, uh, the longtime head of Illumina, whose company um, that he uh, still has a lot of influence over as their um, the chairman of the board of directors completely dominates uh, genetic testing and genome sequencing. Uh, most companies that you may have heard of that offer genetic se- sequencing, like 23andMe or the recently acquired by Blackstone Capital, Ancestry.com, uh, rely on machines produced by uh, Illumina, um, as do you know pretty much all of these uh, medical research things uh, or institutions that are sequencing the new COVID variants and and doing all of this genomic uh, study on on people uh, from their COVID-19 test results, among other things. This is all being done by Illumina, which um, oddly enough, uh, (laughs) this year represents the conclusion of their aggressive five-year plan uh, launched in 2016 to make uh, gene uh, testing uh, the new norm in medicine uh, with the ultimate goal of having all individuals genetically tested from birth to grave, not just for health purposes, but also useful commercial purposes, whatever that may be. Um, So you know, these are some very powerful individuals. To me, it really looks like these individuals have come together uh, because they know that time is of the essence in advancing this agenda. If they wait too long, people will wake up uh, to to the agenda. They can only uh, use, you know, uh, pandemics and lockdowns and all of these strategies we've seen implemented in the past year for so long um, before people are like, well, how does that relate to all this transhumanist tech? And why do you want me to wear this? And you know, all of all of those things, uh, the longer that takes to implement, the 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 riskier it is for them, I would argue. So I think Welcome Leap is a way to um, to supercharge this um, by combining some of the most powerful people in various industries and in various worlds, whether it's, you know, Silicon Valley, uh, DARPA neurotech research and the Welcome uh, Trust dominance of, of medical research. Um, you know, it's it's a pretty significant organization that deserves um deserves considerable attention i would i would argue yeah why I wrote well, this piece. <laughs> demonstrably so and uh and and you're very right to point out the timeline of this because there are so many different threads of this agenda that all have lined up around this period in particular things that started ostensibly long before anyone thought of, of covid or coronavirus but they all started to converge around this time frame um including welcome leap which as you pointed out was first proposed back in 2018 was it and uh, Harpa, which has been on the the uh, the blocks for a while and is now finally getting uh, kickstarted, and various other parts of this agenda, the EU vaccine passport agenda that's been again planned for years now, uh, again all converging on this time frame. And as you say, uh, that magical 2030 year, we see it again and again and again. So it's clearly there is some sort of rush to a finish line going on at this point. Let's. Before we get into what we can actually do about this, let's just introduce people to the creepy programs that Welcome Leap is spearheading. So far, I understand they have four on the table. Yeah, they have four, but actually, as I was writing this, it was three. And then in the middle of the week when I was about to publish it, they create a new one. And then I'm like, oh, all right, well, I have to add that now. So um, even though they've been around for a little over a year, uh, several of these have only launched in 2021. Uh, So it seems like they're picking up other efforts now. And I would argue this is part of a a broader effort of people that were involved in um, developing the policies and narratives of COVID-19 last year have now moved on to plan the post-pandemic phase. 
Um, another group that's related to the Welcome Leap that I talked about in a recent podcast is called the Trinity Challenge. Uh, they're sort of like the Welcome Leap, but funded by by Gates and Facebook and Google, uh, Microsoft. Um, and Eco Health Alliance is very much involved with them. So, you know, that's another example, but uh, a group for another day. Um, <clears throat> but um, as far as these programs go, uh, the first one they launched, they call HOPE, the abbreviate is HOPE, maybe so it sounds nicer, um, but it stands for Human Organs, Physiology and Engineering. Basically, uh, this program, like several of Welcome Leap's programs, has uh, more than one goal. So uh, the first goal, they say, is to basically uh, develop from, from scratch um, uh, human organ systems that also have uh, their own uh, immuno uh, immune function uh, or own uh, immune system, as it were, that's also synthesized, um, you know, from bio, basically bioengineered uh, from from stem cells and, and other sources. Uh, they claim this is a way to eliminate animal testing, um, which you know uh, I think a lot of people would normally uh, perhaps support because obviously there's a lot of um, un unethical things that happen regarding um, la laboratory experimentation on animals. However, these are the same people that promoted, for example, skipping animal trials with the COVID-19 vaccines. So what better way than this platform to allow them to get products uh, straight from development <laughs> into people uh, to try them out by saying, by basically having this organ system, they say eliminates the need for animal testing, which of course has been used uh, for decades and decades and decades. Um, will have to take their word for it that it works and actually replicates the immune system um, and all of this stuff. These aren't exactly the people I'd personally be willing uh, to trust there, but they, they are quite good at selling it under, um, you know, the justification of eliminating, uh, eliminating uh, animal trials and the uh, abuse of animals. But again, it's not like the people involved here uh, care about the well-being of animals or regular humans uh, for that matter. Uh, but the second goal, I think, is really the principal goal of this project, uh, which they say uh, within 10 years will be used to, uh, they hope, uh, to use cultivated or grown organs that are uh, then um, transplanted into people, which obviously would have uh, major implications. But in the short term, uh, they want to develop biological synthetic hybrid organ systems to um, transplant into people. Which obviously, if you look at the transhumanist background of a lot of these uh, organizations or the eugenics background uh, with eugenics and transhumanism, as you pointed out earlier, uh, being intimately related, that is pretty significant. And there's really, you know, if they get to that first point, what will they continue to advance to cultivated organs and all of that? It remains to be seen. Um, it's worth pointing out, too, that very prominent scientists, including George Church, who uh, came under fire for his uh, Epstein funding um, and has a, a lot of um, <clears throat> connections but and was also scrutinized by mainstream media uh, for promoting <laughs> eugenics, um, among other things, is actually involved in several uh, companies that involve either uh, genetically engineering pigs to grow human organs or uh, creating human pig organs to be transplanted uh, into people. Uh, those companies, both of them, um, are actually funded by Boris Nikolic's uh, company Biomatics Capital, Boris Nikolic uh, being the longtime chief scientific advisor to Bill Gates and the backup executor of Jeffrey Epstein's will mysteriously, despite not knowing how that happened. Uh, you can believe that um, if you want. But um, again, uh, will these organs be what they say they're going to be? It's, it's all very... Um, <clears throat> All very unclear, but one thing that points to sort of the the eugenics uh, issue once again in this is how they want to genetically engineer stuff, also not just to prevent disease, which is the uh, most common justification they give, but also to enhance desired properties um, within organs and all of this stuff, bringing uh, inserting uh, you know human augmentation uh, into this uh, purported goal to eliminate disease and uh, make the world a happier, better place. A lot of these um, advertising slogans of, of you know, health utopia um, are quite common in Welcome Leap's documents. Um, so that would be the first program. Um, I'm happy to move on uh, to some of the other ones, unless you'd like to comment, James. Um, it speaks for itself. Let's, let's press ahead. <laughs> All right. So um, the second program they announced, I would argue is, uh, at least to me anyway, was the most disturbing 
Um, it's called The First 1,000 Days Promoting Healthy Brain Networks. Uh, it's specifically targeted at children from three months of age, uh, literal babies, uh, to three-year-old toddlers uh, who it seeks to have as its test subjects, essentially. And so this one really has three different components um, and, and is frankly just... Um, mind boggling. So I would honestly, uh, if this sounds unbelievable to you, I would encourage you to go to either Welcome Leap's website or my article and read the official document describing what this program is, which they abbreviate as 1KD, a much shorter version. Basically what they want to do initially is uh, surveil through various means, uh, including wearables, eye tracking technology, 24 seven surveillance of uh, the youngest children um, in order to risk stratify them, predict their responses to interventions in uh, their developing brains um, for, for various reasons. But the, the first uh, goal is to basically use uh, this access to, to children's brain brains to map them on a on a massive scale as many kids as possible in order to develop what they call the second goal an in silico model of a human developing brain um, essentially you know uh, something as close as they can really get uh, to the singularity uh, basically uh, you know machine intelligence that rivals and surpasses human intelligence which has not happened. Uh, up to this point, but it has been an open goal of futurist and transhumanists, um, people like Ray Kurzweil, the Google, Google's former futurist have been very um, open about uh, the desire for the singularity and how a lot of these people think that uh, this AI powered control grid cannot actually be established until a singularity is developed and, and present. So they essentially um, are looking to create a, a prototype uh, an artificial neural network that would essentially be a model for that uh, by um, mapping and, and surveilling really uh, the brains of, of babies and toddlers in order to presumably uh, from there have something that develops a brain, uh, artificial brain model that develops from, from there like a normal human would over time. But that's not where the program ends. Um, beyond that, what they want to do then is once they have this model of the uh, perfect, I guess you could say, developing brain, uh, they want to then go to, within 10 years, 80% of children and use that model to um, assess children's brains to see if they fit this model or not, and if they do not fit it, to intervene in their developing brain so they fit this AI model of the correct brain, which in the hands of these people, is just totally nuts. And honestly, talking about this, even as I was writing it, it's really hard to find words uh, to describe what this is. But really, you know, if allowed to advance specifically to that third stage, uh, could easily eliminate human creativity, uh, cre uh, the capacity for imagination uh, at a critical time in, in a human being's development. Um, and if you, uh, when we get to the last program, you know, it becomes pretty clear that, that Welcome Leap has an agenda like that um, for adults as well. But the fact that they are targeting uh, children specifically and plan to target them in a massive way uh, within 10 years is just stunning. Um, and I think shows that these people really think um, they cannot be stopped. And it's really, you know, uh, I would argue up to um, concerned parents and concerned citizens. Um, to protect the most vulnerable from this type of invasive technology. Um, but it's, it's honestly, please go and read this document specifically. And I would actually uh, argue that the person responsible for overseeing this, who is a, a doctor in, in England uh, named Holly Baines, you should send her emails to let you know what you think about this program, because a lot of these people running this stuff um, are academics that are not used to public pushback. Uh, you know, obviously be polite, be responsible, but these people should be aware that the general public does not like the avenues their research um, is taking and what it could mean uh, for human society or the human species um, as a whole. And that's true also for these other programs, almost all of which rely on, on academics and universities um, in various countries throughout the world. Um, yeah, well, on that note, let me just interject. Yes, Holly Baines is the program director, but they have a handy dandy list of what they call selected performers 
at the top of this page that they have for the first thousand days of various researchers at different universities. So it's all listed for you if you happen to want to express your concern to these researchers. Um, crazy stuff. You're absolutely right. Uh, I, please do read it and comprehend what they are saying here. 80% of children, they want to get in this net so that they can s compare to their ideal brain model that they're going to construct. It's just absolute insanity. But at it the is. very least, I want people to reflect on the fact that this is, this is eugenics. There is no way around it. This is exactly eugenics. And of course, framed in the way that eugenicists would actually frame it. No, this isn't about eliminating people from the gene pool. It's about improving the gene pool and intervening to help develop and nurture the humans. Yes, that's why we want total surveillance of uh, newborns. People at three months old, we're going to get into them and non-invasively, surely, just map their neural networks and their brains and, create and, and compare them to our models. It's absolute super villain level insanity that you can barely believe they put it in black and white like this, but here it is. And who's going to read a boring report from some charitable foundation like this? Yeah, good point. Um, I do want to point out, too, that while they frame this as making sure that no child is left behind, where have we heard that before? They say this is essential so that uh, children with underdeveloped executive function in their brain or uh, cognition uh, can be normalized and made normal. But it also says... Not only can we do that, but we can take people from normal to well-developed. Again, this human um, augmentation thing. So who um, is going to benefit from the augmentation and who is going to, uh, you know, be modeled after this uh, generic AI thing? I mean, it's definitely part of this um, uh, agenda that goes back to someone like H.G. Wells, a very early eugenicist and also uh, well-known author, um, who talked about uh, eugenics soon would cause a forking of the human species into a uh, an underclass, a goblin-like underclass, and then, you know, a, an elite, attractive uh, upper class and all of this stuff. Um, you know, that's ultimately uh, where this type of, of stuff leads. I, I would also argue, though, um, trying to get this technology so pervasive and having it implemented so young is also a way uh, to acclimate future generations for a life of total and complete surveillance. Uh, having children from three months to three years uh, be constantly surveilled 24-7 in their home, have every movement, every reaction time, every social interaction uh, tracked, cataloged, and documented, analyzed, um, and, and, and made into a, a data point um, is, is very disconcerting, but, a, you know, a, an obvious way to condition the population to uh, expect this, uh, not just from three months to three years, but uh, forever, which is, of course, um, where a lot of these people are hoping, hoping to take this, um, unfortunately. But, you know, if we can't protect our most um, vulnerable citizens from this type of um, invasive surveillance-based technology, I mean, it's just... Uh, I don't, again, I'm, I'm sort of left speechless by the whole thing. Um, you know, if we uh, can't stand up for kids in this instance, um, I, I don't even know what to say uh, for people that aren't outraged by this, uh, to be honest. But Absolutely. And hey, we're only halfway through. That's only program two. There's two more to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's definitely the, the worst one uh, for me, though, just because they're um, overtly targeting children. I think that also speaks to like their hubris and arrogance, uh, too, in a sense that they don't expect pushback from this. And of course, um, what's happened with the uh, trials of COVID-19 vaccines, for example, um, you know, being tested on, on infants and, and toddlers, despite um, all the has come out about these vaccines in the past uh, year or so is, you know, maybe that uh, has made them think that they can get away with something like this more easily. I would really uh, urge the public uh, to prove them wrong. Uh, but anyway, to move on. Uh, so the, the, the next program, the third program of Welcome Leap is called Delta Tissue. Um, and basically they describe this as making a tissue time machine with an emphasis on looking into the future, i.e. predicting disease before you even have any symptoms. And this is actually um, a longstanding ambition of the U.S. military and DARPA, as well as the DTRA um, of the U.S. military having invested a lot in this. And actually just last year, 
Um, I covered this last September, uh, Google and a part of the military that's relatively new, uh, that's heavily influenced by Silicon Valley called the uh, Defense Innovation Unit or DIU, uh, teamed up to develop an AI algorithm that would predict cancer before you have any symptoms with plans to expand that to COVID-19 and other diseases as well. Um, so this is, you know, just uh, the welcome leaps version of that. Uh, but in addition to predicting disease before has a focus on developing precision medicine, which is something we're going to be hearing um, a lot more. Uh, this is actually what things like mRNA vaccines were described as before COVID-19, described as precision medicines, medicines tailored to your genome that involve uh, manipulation either of your uh, genetic uh, makeup or a genetic function to some degree. Um, and, you know, I, if, as I note in the article, there are reports from like CNN and other mainstream media outlets talking about Moderna and mRNA stuff. Uh, well before COVID, they refer to them as gene therapies and frame them as this way, like a revolutionary way of treating cancer specifically, but in such ways that the vaccines are tailored to your genome in all of this stuff or to the lifestyle of each person um, and, and things like that. And this has actually been a major, was a major focus of the, um, of medical research funding under the Obama administration. And we've seen it of course already uh, make a comeback uh, under Biden, unsurprisingly, Eric Lander, the, the top science advisor uh, to Biden, his broad Institute um, that, that he has um, been running since it was created is intimately involved in a lot of these uh, medical uh, <clears throat> uh, research fields and, and and developments as it relates to uh, gene tailored um, medicines, as it were. So this is basically um, a just a uh, you know a program aimed at um, allowing. <laughs> it's pretty interesting in the context of eugenics. It's it's basically um, trusting an algorithm to tell you you'll be sick with something eventually before you have symptoms and then to get you to agree to gene therapies that will presumably prevent that. And if you you know, take out uh, the middle bit there, it's basically just a way to uh, get you to agree to uh, gene therapy for unspecified uh, purposes under the guise of health. That's what I would argue it is, but um, I don't know, maybe you have a different opinion. No, I mean, that's that's exactly right. And of course, it, I mean, the, the paradigmatic example of that has been the eugenical use of, uh, of basically getting rid of, well, I mean, we don't want children being born with defects and we don't want children being born with down syndrome we don't want children being born who aren't perfect in every way i mean obviously this is the eugenical impulse at play again and i think this is just another aspect of that you could have something in the future so we're going to intervene and change your genome trust us we we know these things even if you don't yeah well they definitely sell this stuff with um you know utopian visions particularly this program saying we will eradicate stubbornly challenging diseases uh from around the world diseases that couldn't be treated before we will now treat but it's important to point out that one of the main methods for gene editing in humans that is promoted by groups like this and other related groups is CRISPR and numerous studies over the past decade have shown that CRISPR causes largely irreparable uh, damage to DNA. Um, it was not as precise as once thought um, and can cause a slew of problems. Um, so basically you start using CRISPR on yourself, you're basically stuck in an endless loop where you have to constantly try and repair uh, inadvertent damage that CRISPR may have caused and all of this stuff. Um, of course, that will be a boon for uh, pharmaceutical companies that produce these CRISPR-based uh, cures because you'll basically be hooked for life. It's really not that different than the Monsanto model uh, with agriculture. Of course, unsurprising that you have people before COVID-19, um, you know, Bill Gates, for example, a major evangelist of that Monsanto model, now an evangelist for this model. <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, yeah, pretty telling. Yeah, and uh, that reminds me, I, I've been watching a lot of this kind of stuff lately, the, the, the sort of personalized medicine and all of this that they're trying to sell to the public. And it's interesting, even within their own propaganda, even their own, you know, cake and, and rainbows and unicorn farts that they're trying to sell to the public, they'll, even they have these concerns. Well, you know, we could be making changes to the genome, the hereditable part of the genome that could fundamentally change humanity. So we probably want to be a little bit careful about that. But anyway, da, da, da. but we can't stop. <laughs> exactly. No, I mean, you know? stop. Yeah. Of course not. No, 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 no. Yeah. 
All right. Well, um, I guess I'll move on to the last program then, which is sort of like the one for toddlers, but this one aimed at adults um, and, and, and is quite telling because they frame it. It's called multi-channel psych. Um, they frame it as a way to cure depression, to develop new complex biological treatments uh, for depression. But then as you start to read through this, they say, well, what we actually want to treat is something called anhedonia, uh, which is, I, I believe that's how you pronounce it. I may be wrong. Uh, <laughs> sorry if that's, um, if that's the case. But essentially, they describe anhedonia as being the, one of the main symptoms of depression and the, the, the specific uh, symptom of depression that they want to treat. Um, and if you read a, uh, the footnote, the fine print <laughs> uh, of where they say this, uh, they say, I'll just read the quote, quote, uh, while there are many definitions of anhedonia, we are less interested in the investigation of reduced consumatory pleasure, the general experience of pleasure, or the inability to experience pleasure. Rather, we will prioritize investigations of anhedonia as it relates to impairments in the effort-based reward system, e.g. reduced motivation to complete tasks and decreased capacity to apply effort to achieve a goal, end quote. So basically, they're not actually focusing on treating depression or the aspects of depression uh, that if treated would improve a depressed person's quality of life. They are instead focused on treating aspects of depression that prevent people from being a good worker, a good worker drone that regardless of uh, other things and other factors and circumstances uh, will continue to plug away and press the right buttons and complete the right tasks um, and make the bosses happy. So. Um, that's pretty telling because that basically uh, undercuts their uh, initial justification right away. It's not about treating depression. It's about finding treatments that allow depressed people uh, to continue working indefinitely uh, while not actually making them happier um, for all intents and purposes. But one of the uh, most interesting research areas I found that they're hoping to pursue um, are the development of wearables that they say will uh, provide uh, an easy way to quantify mood, um, your sleep, your emotional state, and also your effort levels, your motivation levels, and your energy levels, and uh, your social interaction, and also ways within the brain to manipulate the axis between the adrenal glands the pituitary glands and the hypothalamus, just extreme manipulation uh, over the human body. Uh, that particular axis though with the hypothalamus, pituitary and adrenal glands is significant as well though, because that system not only um, manages uh, stress reactions in the body, but also immunity and also fertility, which is of course, um, significant in the in the theme of eugenics here. Um, but is such a wearable far off? I don't really think so because Amazon uh, claims that their uh, fitness <laughs> wearable um, halo uh, can quantify your emotion uh, already based on your voice and, and other things and be like, gee, you sounded depressed from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. today. Um, and of course, Amazon just bought this um, online pharmacy so they can send you uh, antidepressants straight away yeah, just from exactly. listening to your voice. Mm -hmm. Among other things, that's sort of the future they're looking to build here. But of course, you know, if this wearable does go to market and is uh, going to keep you uh, from uh, monitor your uh, motivation levels and the effort you're putting in, uh, there's nothing to stop corporations like Amazon uh, from using that um, on their workers or not even, you know, ones that... Um, you know, jobs are, or not even companies that are ex, uh, as exploitative as Amazon, but maybe even office jobs or maybe even uh, banking jobs or white collar jobs can see this implemented and like to make sure everyone is yeah. uh, putting I in mean, the right amount of effort at work and all of this. Right. Stuff. I mean, you have the you have the dual specter here. Either this is a load of total baloney, like lie detector tests and everything else that they've tried to sell to the public. Oh, we totally know what, you know, we can read your mind where it's total nonsense, but they'll use it to sell stuff to you and whatever else or lock you away or whatever else they want to do with it. Or they really can develop something that actually can act, act accurately predict your mood and what, what have you, in which case it will be used for all sorts of Orwellian horrible nonsense anyway. So either way, it's terrible. I, I think the only, I, I think I would disagree with uh, see here's my take on on this program to me i think approaching the depression issue from the anhedonia perspective is actually potentially a fruitful way of looking at this because i certainly get it from the egghead perspective at the very least 
uh, you know, measuring if somebody is feeling pleasure or whatever, or happy or fulfilled or whatever. That's that's airy fairy emotional stuff. You know, how are we going to measure that? No, what we can measure is: Do you have the a set of goals? Are you working towards them? Can you achieve them? You know, that's something measurable that we can see in the real world. So I understand from the egghead perspective why they would want to tackle that, but that seems to be directly undermined by the wearable that instead of having those sort of outside observable metrics that we don't need, you know, brain tracking devices in order to monitor. No, but we're going to need these wearables that are constantly monitoring your brain waves and whatever else to tell what mood you're in. But doesn't that kind of undermine the whole Anadonia approach to this, that we're going to solve this and we're going to make it see the... Anyway, that's where I go from this. I mean, to yeah, me, it seems just I, like I, the convenient excuse for getting more wearables and trackables in everybody's life. Right. And I think, um, you know, it, the wearable isn't the only thing they want to develop either. Uh, another thing they have in here is what they call a single session neural monitoring uh, device that can define a treatment predictive brain state. Basically, you're taken to a, a super machine that can interrogate your uh, human brain state directly. Uh, it says, and determine, uh, predict how your brain will respond to various uh, interventions or treatments that may, you know, make you more motivated at work or, or whatever they tell you. I mean, it's definitely your um, human you know, brain concerning. state. I mean, was this proposal written by an AI or something? <laughs> your <laughs> human brain state, as opposed know. to I mean, whoever is writing this document, right? Well, these people work with, you know, specific vocabulary and buzzwords and often tend to be pretty uh, insulated when they have discussions about stuff with other like minded experts. So they tend to have kind of a specialized vocabulary in that regard. So, yes, uh, uh, human brain state is a term that they use that uh, obviously would not be used colloquially. Um, I think that's. That's fair to say, but you know this is a, this program is obviously just an effort to advance, as, as you mentioned, uh, wearables and trackables uh, in uh, at, at mass within the population. Uh, the previous one making that acceptable for children, very young children, babies, um, and then this one allowing it, uh, you know, creating that same type of uh, wearable, but more applicable to someone who has already entered the workforce. Uh, for example. Um, and this is pretty significant, too, because um, uh, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of these uh, players uh, uh, have ties to the World Economic Forum, of course. Um, and um, one of, I would argue, actually, probably one of the most, uh, probably actually the most important speech that I've seen uh, at Davos recently in terms of what's coming uh, took place in January 2020. It was Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari, a close friend of uh, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, um, whose work is heavily touted by Barack Obama and very much loved uh, by the WEF crowd. Uh, he's given this fawning introduction. I believe her name is Orit Gadiesh, um, uh, who basically runs Bain Capital <laughs> right now. Um, you know, he's very much um, praised by, by the elite. And in this speech, he basically talks about how there's going to be an inevitable rise of what he calls digital dictatorships and data colonialism, and that this uh, development uh, throughout the world will become irreversible once the majority of the population starts wearing wearables that can interrogate their brain state and their thoughts and what they're thinking. And the, the example he gives is, okay, so you're in this uh, society, this digital dictatorship, and uh, the, the, the great leader, uh, big brother, whatever, is giving a speech and you can outwardly look happy and be clapping and and just look like look just like you're supposed to look but the wearable will know that you inside are angry and unhappy and have the wrong emotions and the wrong thoughts in relation to that speech and he these are his words in the ne the next morning you'll be in the gulag as a result of that and you know the 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 wef elite um, the Davos crowd are there clapping. He openly implores them uh, at the end of that talk uh, that the people in this room, the World Economic Forum members, uh, take uh, take hold and develop this technology for their use. Otherwise, the rats might get a hold of it. Um, very jarring statement to make. Um, I would encourage you to go and watch it um, so you can see the context and, and the other ways in which he talks about the uh, quote unquote rats and what you think that may mean, um, among other things. The whole um, 
speech is very instructive, but it's very telling uh, that the the elite that are driving these agendas know uh, what will happen once the, the masses uh, start to wear wearables. And <clears throat> Um, as was recently covered in another um, investigation on Unlimited Hangout, uh, Jeremy Lafredo, who who wrote that piece, uh, pointed out that there's um, you know several companies now, including in the U.S., uh, health insurance companies and life insurance companies that will uh, give you benefits uh, if you wear a wearable, a, a Fitbit for now, um, or or you know Amazon's Halo, one of these that are currently marketed for fitness. If you wear one of these, uh, you'll get uh, you know your life insurance or health insurance plan. You'll pay a reduced premium. Uh, how long until that segued into um, perhaps Medicare for all, something that people um, in the U.S. on the left um, have been fighting for for a long time? Of course, they'll never get that uh, from the U.S. establishment, not unless they're uh, the people that get free health care are willing to give up their complete privacy um, and biometric data in exchange, which is something I could actually see happening uh, given uh, the nature of, uh, you know, Biden's chief scientific advisor, this effort to create HARPA um, and, and usher in this age of predictive precision medicine in the U.S. Um, you know, I would encourage Medicare for all advocates to uh, look quite closely at the developments here um, in that event, because what better way to get mass adoption uh, than to make it free, um, right? So that's probably how they will um, uh, seek to do that, not unlike what they've done with COVID vaccinations, uh, probably the first time in, in, in U.S. history that I can think of where something was made completely free to everyone and you get a free donut and you can do it at McDonald's and you get all this free stuff. Um, you know, that's not very common in the U.S. So um, it could easily happen with the adoption of wearables. And if so, you know, as, as Harari says to the web crowd, digital dictatorship, it's irreversible. Once it's here, it's here forever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, that represents the carrot side of the equation. Oh, we can reduce your premiums. Come on, it'll be great. But of course, there's always the stick as well. And that's, I think, the that's the thing which... I understand, in retrospect, it all falls into place, but the thing that I don't think I would have predicted sitting there in 2019, thinking about it as hard as I could, I don't think I would have predicted that, of course, of course, they needed some sort of ginned-up health crisis in order to propel us into the next stage of the transhumanist agenda. Of course, that is exactly what they need to break down that biological barrier that we have to start implanting their technologies in us. And of course, they're going to call it a vaccine or whatever else. And of course, it's going to be used as the thin edge of the wedge to start the transformation. And it just makes so much perfect sense now that I see it lining up. But I didn't put it together like that beforehand. And obviously these people did. They've been thinking about this for a very long time. A very long time. Uh, it, it's true. Uh, you know, uh, for me also in 2019, a lot of this I wasn't uh, necessarily expecting. A lot of developments going on that year I wasn't aware of until uh, COVID-19 hit and a lot of our attention was directed uh, towards these fields. But the more uh, people like you and me and, and several others have looked at this, uh, the more clear it, it's become that the, the, these are uh, agendas that have been decades upon decades um, in the making, um, you know, um, it's no coincidence that you see a lot of uh, big time players from past um, bio alarmism incidents, whether it's uh, uh, the avian flu scare of the Bush administration, the anthrax attacks, among other things and things going, you know, uh, even decades before then again, popping up and being influential um, in policies uh, today now. Um, it's just, uh, it's quite jarring, frankly. But uh, what is important now, of course, is that we can see, uh, now that we're wise to the game, as it were, um, we can see from this point where they want to take it. I think Welcome Leap is an instructive uh, example of that. And I think also the fact that they're just starting up um, shows that this technology, despite, you know, black uh, budget research programs of the military and intelligence. Obviously, they have advanced technology we don't know about. And probably that's true in several of, of these fields uh, that we've been talking about. But the fact they need something like Welcome Leap and they need this technology uh, to be uh, adopted and, and tested on th potentially thousands, tens of thousands um, of people shows that they can't do it at those you know, black budget research sites alone, uh, they need uh, a, cert a, a significant contingent 
of the human population to use as uh, data points for AI and other things in order to take this agenda further. And I think this is really important for people that plan to resist this agenda because it shows that our consent matters and that this can be stopped. Their agenda um, and their end game, uh, they often like to cast as inevitable. There's nothing you can do, little peon. You may resist, but we will defeat you. Uh, you know, I think Welcome Leap shows that this is not the case. And I think people really need to take that to heart. There's still a lot that can be done to derail and stop this agenda. Um, and I think uh, uh, Welcome Leap's uh, programs and maybe some of these uh, academics, if you contact them and explain politely um, where this agenda, uh, what this agenda means to you, uh, you know, and, and give them some, some pushback, um, you know, I don't think that these individuals are expecting that academics are usually very much isolated in their um, ivory towers of academia, as it were. Um, same with a lot of these these think tanks and groups like the Welcome Trust, um, you know, because usually it's politicians that get the brunt uh, of that type of pushback or maybe even corporations um, at some times. But usually these groups um, do not. And they're really intimately involved in advancing it to a big degree. Um, so I think, you know, it's time to start thinking about um, how we can uh, show groups like this that uh, the public is not uh, down uh, for the next steps of this agenda. Um, and it's really important, I think, for people to, to not lose faith that there really is an opportunity here uh, to stop these, the, these agendas from advancing to the point where they want to take them. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So let's let's hone in on this. This is not 2010. It's not even 2019 or 2020. This is 2021. We're not just simply documenting and detailing the beast. We are actively resisting it and hopefully stopping it in its tracks or at the very least derailing this agenda. So of course the question always comes back to what we can do. And as always, I think the very first ground level of this is awareness true awareness of what is happening right now because it is more important than ever that we understand and see through the propaganda on this because it's going to be very effective propaganda for a lot of people. It's going to be covered in sunshine and rainbows and lollipops. They're going to eliminate cancer. They're going to wheel out the, 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 the little four-year-old girl who had this terrible one-in-a-million birth defect and we cured her with the gene therapy. Oh, look at this crippled person. Now he can type with his brain. They're going to wheel out all of this wonderful stuff that you can have if you just let us into your brain. And we have to see that for what it is, see through it, and not comply, not cooperate, not feed them our data. Easier said than done. Even a conversation like this one is going to end up on GooTube, where it is going to end up in the Google servers, that is going to do its algorithmic uh, uh, thing to, uh, to analyze our voices and come up with the automatic transcription of everything that we're saying that gets fed into and part a part of the, the the feedback process for developing language recognition for example which um, is is one of those examples of something that I, I have been involved with, I suppose, for a decade now because I upload things to YouTube. And I remember, I remember in 2000, I think it was 11, 12, somewhere like that, where they first started doing this. So we're going to auto transcribe the videos. And I remember turning that on just to see what it looked like. And it was gobbledygook. It was nonsense. It was stupid. It was almost like a game. Turn it on and see what the, the automatic captions were. And it was always just total garbage nonsense. And, and then I remember a year or two later, I checked again and, oh, it's perfect now. Oh, it's getting every word. And now it's at the point where literally sometimes I have to turn on the captions to understand because I can't hear, physically hear what someone is saying and the captions have it. it. It's gotten really creepy. How did that happen? Because millions and millions and millions of people are uploading millions and millions of hours of video every single day so that these algorithms can get better and better and better at detecting human language. That's how it works. This was based on Google Voice, which was a handy little feature that they rolled out a decade and a half ago. People used, then they discarded it. Well, what was all that about? Oh, they were just harvesting your voice data so that they could work on their language recognition algorithms. This is how it works. Amazon Echo, 
Oh, everyone's got an Amazon Echo, and now, oh, by the way, did you know they've got Amazon Sidewalk now, and everyone with an Echo is part of this wireless network that's just scanning everything all the time, or the Ring cameras, every single piece of this, the phone that everyone is carrying around with them is part of this architecture, and more and more and more people are buying and buying into this wearable, trackable technology that's becoming more and more invasive and is starting to take more and more. And, hey, now it's the it's the fitness Fitbit or whatever that, oh, it'll read your brain scans. Oh, it'll tell you everything about yourself. We have to resist this. We have to understand where this is going. And we have to not, at the very least, not buy this technology, which they are using to scrape up and snarf up all our data on us. Whew. I'm sorry, that was more of a rant than a question, but feel free to interject <laughs> with your own. No, no, I mean, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, I, I think people uh, in their personal lives need to take this information and, and decide on a red where they draw the line when it comes to this technology. If you need a, smart for, a smartphone for work or whatever, you know, fine, but you don't need a smartwatch. You don't need uh, a Google Nest or an Amazon Echo. Uh, that I mean, I, I really don't, uh, you know, I personally don't, see why people need that. Uh, but, you know, obviously you're feeding a very different type of beast, even than you are uh, with a smartphone to a degree. Um, but there's all things, uh, you know, people can do in terms of how they use tech uh, to feed this as, as little as possible. Um, I would argue um, one big step, you know, uh, decouple yourself from Google products um, as much as possible. Um, in social media networks like Twitter and Facebook are openly partnering, for example, with the Biden administration's war on domestic terror um, and also feeding this uh, AI beast, as it were. Um, you know, if you want to uh, follow people on there on Twitter, for example, um, make a burner account where you follow people, but you don't like or comment on anything or something like that, or just get off it entirely. You know, because not only are you feeding the AI beast, you're feeding the war on domestic terrorism uh, in the U.S. to a significant degree. It's time to opt out um, of these systems. Really, the way out um, of this whole mess, um, as I see it, is really counter economics and refusing to use the products of the corporations and, and refusing to be dependent on the government supporting this. Because without uh, us needing them, they just go away. Uh, really, the only reason they're able to do this and exert this much power and influence is because people are so dependent uh, on them. And um, I think the more we can get away from that, uh, the better off uh, we ultimately will be. But a lot of it comes down to deciding to take a principled stand over your convenience and your comfort. Yes, a lot of these new te technological advances may make you know this thing more convenient. Oh, it's certainly more convenient to unlock my phone with my face then by entering a six digit pin, you know, I, once it gets to that point, um, you know, you've been had, I would argue by this um, marketing bit of, uh, you know, convenience, um, trumping, you know, your data uh, and privacy and, and all of this stuff, it becomes a data harvesting uh, operation, which you can argue it, it has been, you know, from the get go, maybe the internet as a whole um, is even that, but I think we just need to be a lot more conscientious um, about the stuff and and start taking principled stands, even if it may be slightly less convenient for you. It's really the least we can do uh, to fight back against this and sort of, uh, at the very least, um, <clears throat> resist this uh, effort to herd us in this particular direction by offering things that add more and more convenience with every advance, you know, it's time to be like, no, what I have is enough. I don't need any more and just stop it there. You know, I'm not going to tell people what to do, but every individual has, you know, a line they can draw um, in that regard. And it's really quite time to start doing so. Yeah. Well, I mean, everyone who's listening to this conversation digitally tech through their digital technology is bought in in some way, shape, or form. No one is clean of all of this unless you really are living in a cabin in the woods, but then you're not listening to us, right? So <laughs> that we, we're all involved in this in some way. It's just a question of, yes, where do you draw those lines? And may I humbly suggest that when the Welcome Leap researchers show up at your door asking if they can put scanners and cameras on your three-month-old baby, perhaps that's the point at which you say, you know what? No, I think I'm good. Please don't. I think that would be a good place to draw that line in the sand. Anyway, at the very, very least, we have to understand that this really is happening. They really are going for this. They really are setting this 2030 date as some sort of deadline for all these different programs that they're trying to... I mean, it's just... 
insanity. So we have to be up to speed on this so that we can more effectively understand it, let alone counteract it. So I'm going to once again, of course, uh, direct people to the article itself, which as much as we've talked about already, <laughs> there's so much more information in this article, so many more links to explore, so much more to understand about this. But I think I think we've at least outlined what this agenda is and where it's going. I understand you're going to be following up this particular article with uh, more articles, question mark, about Welcome Trust. <laughs> Well, hopefully just one, but yeah, um, so a lot of people, including yourself, did uh, brilliant exposés on Bill Gates, for example, um, but I would argue that the Welcome Trust uh, is really on the same level in terms of its influence, particularly in the past year and a half uh, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but um, I haven't really seen um, a deep dive on them and who they are. They have a very lengthy history, um, as I mentioned earlier, so I definitely think it's something uh, that needs to be uh, sort of fleshed out. They need to stop being... Uh, called this medical charity, um, because in fact, if you actually go back and you look at how it was founded and created by this pharmaceutical magnet, he wanted it to be both a charity and a business working together. So you have the Welcome Trust, the charity front for what are called what the Welcome Foundations that are for-profit businesses that operate in close connection uh, with the trust. I mean, it's basically a way to have a business look like a charity and to make as much money as possible as a result. And that's just one of many myths that I feel like need to be uh, dispelled about the Welcome Trust, including its uh, eugenicist links, I think also need to be fleshed out in more detail than I did in that uh, past AstraZeneca uh, Google, or sorry, AstraZeneca Oxford piece. I said Google because I uh, did an interview on that again and got uh, pulled off of YouTube because I talked about how Google is invested in that vaccine. Um, Surprise. So, um, yes, hopefully there will be uh, an article there, but uh, more it, it may be a little bit a couple of weeks because of, uh, of course, Cyber Polygon, uh, which I've been covering uh, pretty extensively, uh, the, the cyber attack uh, agenda uh, since 2019. So I have uh, some work to do on there, but hopefully soon. Yes. Yes. Let me add parenthetically for anyone who is watching this on YouTube, it will undoubtedly be pulled from YouTube in the near future, I think. So um, you should not be watching this on YouTube. That, that goes without saying. But I should note that uh, our, yes, our Oxford AstraZeneca interview was, I think, the first video to get struck or at least uh, pulled off of my extras channel, my secondary, my backup channel. Sorry. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, oh no, YouTube. Uh, it got me uh, I want to stay on there also. forever. Oh, please allow me on your controlled and censored platform. No, please stop using YouTube. That would be a good place to start with all this. Anyway, as you say, yes, there has not been a lot of attention to Welcome Trust, so I'm very much looking forward to your next article. I would very much like to, to read about that. And all the other stuff. Of course, I hope by this point people know that they can... Uh, read all of your stuff and those of your co-workers and, and co-researchers at unlimitedhangout.com. But more importantly, since you and I have been removed from Patreon, probably not coincidentally there. I think that all relates yeah. around our conversation about Oxford AstraZeneca. But anyway, um, how can people support your work? Uh, well, if you go to unlimitedhangout.com, there's a support us tab. And there, um, if you uh, wish to uh, support uh, my work and those of the people uh, that, that also write for my site, um, you can uh, support in a few ways. Um, a lot of, uh, I, I basically uh, have like my podcast, for example, is on rockfin, R-O-K-F-I-N.com. Uh, uh, and that obviously is a great way to support my work. But for people that don't want to use that platform for whatever reason, um, through my website on that support us tab, there's different uh, options where you can also access uh, some content that I paywall, but it's just paywalled for like the first, you know, four or five days before publicly released because, you know, I don't have a Patreon anymore. So everyone's got to, you know, have their, their own way to stay uh, in the business. So if you find my work valuable, you know, of course, and, and those of my coworkers valuable, of course, your support is greatly appreciated. Yeah. Well, um, I hate to say this, but we are still in a window of opportunity for the independent media where we still can at least somehow claw out a living through doing this. Um, although the avenues for doing so are being winnowed. But uh, I can imagine a few years from now, we could have a very different conversation where maybe we're not able to make a living doing this and it's going to get harder and harder. So anyway, support Whitney and the work she's doing while you, while you can do that at least as easily as we can do it now, uh, because it's going to get harder in the future. Um, 
Not a happy way to end this conversation. But once again, the power is in our hands. We have to stop giving it to these corporations and trusts and other entities so that they can rule and lord over us. The power is ours. Let's keep that um, in sight and in our minds. Whitney, we have covered an awful lot in this conversation. Anything else you want to uh, point, touch on before we end? Uh, no, I think I think we definitely uh, covered a lot. I just do want to uh, underscore that point you made that uh, our consent matters and really the power is in our hands. Um, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, Welcome Leap is, a, is an illustration of that, um, but also their efforts to censor uh, people like you and me, try and take away our income from us doing this work shows that uh, those of us in independent media that have chosen uh, to speak up about this, these issues and, and COVID-19, among other things, are having a big impact. Um, and it, it's become uh, bigger uh, with time, not less, uh, despite the um, extreme censorship efforts. Um, so, you know, I would also encourage people watching to perhaps, uh, if they're interested, maybe nudge some bigger voices um, that there isn't a lot of <laughs> time left uh, to wait for these issues to become safe. Some issues never become safe, like 9-11, for example. Um, but really, time is of the essence, as we've uh, spoken of uh, several times. This is set to uh, end, uh, in their view, uh, by 2030. That is nine years away. That's not a lot of time. We can't wait 20 years uh, with the case of 9-11, for example, to finally start talking about what's been going on. Um, so, uh, you know, if you have uh, content creators that you support um, that uh, have declined to cover these issues up until this point, perhaps you could politely nudge them uh, because time is really of the essence. The more awareness we raise about these issues, the better off we will be. Excellent points. And uh, yep, they wouldn't be trying to cut out our tongues if they didn't fear what we had to say. So let's keep saying it. And uh, neener, neener, neener to all the censors out there. All right. <laughs> Okay, Whitney, I think we're going to leave it there for today. Uh, thank you for your work and keep doing it. Thank you. My pleasure.